A 75-year-old man with an ulcerated erythematous nodule on the scalp. And let's see, do I have, oh, I included an extra um, image here. This is the CD10 stain, blazing positive on CD10. Let's see here about making this bigger. All right, again, apologies for the wrinkles, but this is such a uh, very valuable case for teaching that occasionally I overlook when that kind of stuff happens. Histotechs are amazing, but you know sometimes the tissue does not cooperate. So we got this ulcerated nodule here, and the dermis is filled with cells. And when we go closer to look at the, what this sheet of cells um, looks like cytologically, all right, what this, these cells have a very unique appearance. What uh, if you had to use a word, what word would you use to describe this cytologic pattern or appearance to these cells? Crescent. Yeah, they yeah the, the nuclei look like little crescent shape, right? And they've got this blob of very dense pink. You know what I mean by dense? Dense means like the it looks like the cytoplasm looks hard. And I know that sounds kind of silly. Like in in pathology, we get really used to talking with these these words that make sense to us. But you know, like what do you mean hard cytoplasm? It looks like it's so packed full of pink stuff that's very dense and homogenous, kind of like the pink a color of like uh, like keratinocytes. Their cytoplasm is kind of what I'd call hard or dense. It's packed full of keratin as opposed to loose cytoplasm, which would be like what xanthomatous cells would have or cells that have kind of loose, fluffy looking cytoplasm. But these have this blob of really dense pink stuff. And then it's, it's so big that it's pushing the nucleus out of the way. It's pushing the nucleus out to the peripheral edge of the cell. So um, the other to any, anyone else, there's, there's two possible answers you could use for this that I feel like are very similar pattern-wise for this blob that's made the nucleus become eccentric. Raptoid or plasmacytoid. There you go. Yeah. And that was, is that a pathologist who said that or a derm resident? Um, I'm the fellow. Oh, okay. Sorry. Awesome. Hey, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. And to me, I, I'm into soft tissue, so I like the word rhabdoid, but rhabdoid and plasmacytoid, I feel like are, there may be some subtle difference between them, but to me, I feel like they're very similar terms where they mean that the nucleus is eccentric, just like a plasma cell. It's pushed to the side. And you particularly when you see like a blob of pink, dense pink stuff, I, a lot of times people use the word rhabdoid when, when the nucleus pushes the side and it's got a blob of pink. So these are kind of rhabdoid looking cells. Diffuse sheet filling the dermis. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, packed all the way up against the epidermis. The epidermis is ulcerated away. CD10 is positive. So what's your, uh, what's your diagnosis or differential diagnosis here? Because I only gave you one stain. And as you probably figured out, more stains were done, which I have not informed you about. Well, let me ask you this. What do you think that this case might have been misdiagnosed as? AFX. Yes. So with the CD10 expression, CD10 has been in the past described as a stain that's helpful for the diagnosis of atypical fibrosanthoma or the very closely related, or in my opinion, I think they're just on a spectrum, pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, which is basically the term we give for AFX when it invades down into the subcutis and, and has the potential for more aggressive behavior. Okay, so yes, this case was understandably um, diagnosed as um, an unusual example, they thought, because of the cytology, but they thought it fit best for the AFX slash pleomorphic dermal sarcoma spectrum. They had done, I think, uh, pan-keratin, S100, and uh, what else did they, they had done that? that Pan-keratin, S100, and I think P40 or P63, and they were all negative. So reasonable to understand that they've ruled out, you know, the slam differential, as you guys know, right? You, you rule out your spindled squame and lyomyosarcomas. Although in my opinion, that doesn't really come into my differential for AFX very often because it usually looks different. Um, angiosarcoma occasionally can be solid. Certainly you could, you could potentially see an angiosarcoma look kind of like this. And I can't remember, maybe they had done a vascular marker. This was years ago and also melanoma. Okay. So they had done the, the major stains there. But, um, okay, um, who, the fellow, what's your name, dear fellow? I apologize. Oh, Adam Pericon. Oh, Adam, yeah, Adam Pericon. I, I forgot that you were a fellow already. Awesome, man. Well, good work. <laughs> All right, Adam. Well, what would you do with this case? What, what's in your differential or what additional, um, what additional uh, stains would you like to do to solve this? Well, if uh, the uh, cytomorphology can consider, you know, plasma cytoma due to CD138, rhabdoid morphology can get a Desmond SMA as well. Um, and then, you know, like proximal type epithelioid sarcomas can exhibit the same type of morphology, consider INI1 or even BRG1. 
fantastic differential. Very, very good. And yes, I think your point about plasma cell myeloma is outstanding. It is often not on people's radar. And because it is a heme thing, it can look a lot like when it gets into the skin, it often doesn't look like regular plasma cells. I've, I've seen a fair number of cases in my former job. We had a lot of patients with myeloma. And so we would see cases where it got in the skin and it often looked kind of like leukemia cutis, real ugly, but it can have a wide range of features. And the hematopathologists uh, that I worked with would show me case, cases again and again that did not look at all like what I expected a myeloma would look like. Sometimes very pleomorphic, sometimes almost spindly, super scary. So it's really uh, quick on my differential to think of doing plasma cell markers and also to remember that plasma cells and and myeloma don't express CD45, which is kind of thought of as the pan white, white cell marker. Or they often don't express that, right? CD138 is a good stain for them, but also remember that CD138 stains squamous cells and a lot of epithelial tumors. So it can, it, don't rely on that alone, of course. I, I know that you know this, Adam, but just to, for all the other people who are, who are listening. So MUM1, M-U-M-1 is another great marker. And I asked one of my heme colleagues who had a lot of myeloma experience. I said, if you just had one marker to screen for myeloma, uh, what would you use? And they said they would actually use MUM1. But I'll, if I have a high suspicion, I'll often use both, CD138 and MUM. And then you can go on to do Kappa Lambda and stuff. But this wasn't that. This was Desmond positive, as you went to right away. And that was an excellent job. So if you had to then then do anything else, any other stains you want after Desmond positive? Yeah, you need the uh, the more specific skeletal muscle markers. So like Myogen and MyoD1 look for uh -huh. nuclear expression. Very good. Now let's see. This is the uh, Desmond. We can see here for the residents, this is a piece of appendix used as control. And you can see the Desmond strongly staining the muscle wall and the muscular mucosae layers of the appendix. And then here, blazing expression of Desmond. So that's what's making those, those little blobs uh, can, are oftentimes when you have those uh, rhabdoid morphology, it means that there's a globule of intermediate filament. Um, that's that's filling up and that's why it has that hard look in a lot of tumors It's keratin like you said proximal type epithelioid sarcomas and malignant rhabdoid tumor Which may be on a close spectrum have that rhabdoid appearance and are packed full of keratin in this case Desmond was the intermediate filament filling up these cells an extremely uh, strong diffuse staining here um, and uh, then here's the myogenin, also known as MYF4, MYF4. Is a, it's a nuclear transcription factor related to skeletal muscle development, and it is going to be positive in the nuclei of rhabdomyosarcomas and um, rarely anything else. Also, there's another stain called MyoD1, which uh, serves a similar role and can be used as a marker. So a lot of times, depends on the type of rhabdomyosarcoma, um, a lot of times the, the staining for myogenin and myod1 will just be focal. So you can see it here, nice strong nuclear staining just in a subset of the uh, tumor cells. And that's often the case except for things like alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, which is extremely rare in the skin, although we're working on a case report of one right now, actually. We're about ready to submit it. And those are like diffusely all the cells will be positive. So yeah, this was an example of uh, the kind of relatively newly described, I mean, not really new, but uh, this uh, entity called epithelioid rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, Chris Fletcher has uh, written about that, very famous, uh, well-known soft tissue pathologist. So this was epithelioid rhabdomyosarcoma in the skin. And um, it, it, it seems like of um, rhabdomyosarcomas are always thought of as pediatric tumors because they certainly are much more common in kids than adults, but definitely adults even older adults can occasionally get rhabdomyosarcomas of various types, and those can arise as primary tumors in the skin extremely rarely. Um, soon after I finished my fellowship at Emory, I co-authored a paper with Steve Billings and Trent Marburger and other colleagues where we put together a series of cutaneous rhabdomyosarcomas. Um, I think we had 11 cases, and to my knowledge, that's still the largest series in the literature. So it's very, very rare, but it does happen. And because of that, and I've seen a few more cases in practice now since we wrote that paper, I include Desmond on my initial screening um, when I have a, a, the AFX differential for malignant spindle cell tumors in the skin. I add in Desmond, and I also do ERG or CD31 because I've seen rare cases of solid kind of spindly or epithelioid angiosarcoma that didn't have any obvious vascular channels. And um, those are very aggressive tumors that need to be potentially handled differently. And in this case, this poor patient, unfortunately, um, within six months of diagnosis, had lung metastases, multiple lung metastases. And I never did find out the final follow-up, but I suspect that he probably died from his disease very quickly 
um, afterwards. These are these can be very aggressive tumors. Some some sarcomas when they arise in the skin tend to be a better prognosis and more indolent. Uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is not one of those. It, it still has the fully malignant potential when it's in the skin. So I do include Desmond in my um, screening test. And if Desmond's positive, I reflex to myogene. And I will point out uh, for, for Adam and anyone else who's going to do derm path, um, I do um, from time to time see focal Desmond expression in tumors that otherwise look uh, and stain like AFX or pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. And usually I just kind of chalk that up to nonspecific myofibroblastic differentiation. I will add myogenin just to be sure, but usually rhabdos are going to have a lot of Desmond, not just focal. And I feel like um, if it's a pleomorphic ugly tumor and just focal Desmond, to me, that's not enough to make it a leiomyosarcoma. So, uh, but I guess that would be the other possibility, but I feel like ugly pleomorphic spindle cell leiomyosarcomas usually are big, deep, soft tissue tumors, not, not in the skin. In the skin, leiomyosarcoma usually looks like a smooth muscle tumor, even when it's really ugly. It still retains that kind of pink cytoplasm fascicular growth pattern. Um, so yeah, epithelioid, uh, rhabdo, and a good discussion of the differential of rhabdoid and plasmacytoid tumors in the skin. Excellent work.